حمدا كثيرا وطيبا مباركا في وصلوات الله وسلامه على نبينا الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى من تمسك بسنته بإحسان إلى إلى يوم الدين ثم ما بعد في خير الكلام كلام ربنا وخير الهدى هدى رسولنا محمد بن عبد الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا. We didn't complete the last chapter about the na'il of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his sandals or his shoes. So we want to complete the bab and we left off at the issue of the prohibition that he made of wearing your shoe where you have one shoe on and the other one off. And we explained that the ulama of al-Islam they gave multiple reasons for that, and we mentioned two of them. That one of the reasons why the Prophet prohibited us, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, from walking in one shoe and from having another one on your feet, is because of the justice that the person has to do to his body. Al Islam is the religion of al adal, and al adal is from the munjiyat from those issues that will save the individual. So if you wear one shoe, you should wear the other one on the other foot because it's not fair for the foot that's barefooted. It should have protection just like the shoe that has, just like the foot that has the shoe on it. And the shoe is going to protect the foot from any injury, be it any lies or So you have to do the same thing with the other foot, the justice of al Islam. And the other reason is what Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, Rahmatullahi alayhi, concerning al-qaza, al when you shave the head of the baby, or you shave your head. In the case of the companion, the young boy, his parents had shaved part of his head, his hair, and they left the other part to grow, and that's what's called the qaza. And the Prophet told them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, either leave it all or cut it all. Cut it all off. So you have to be fair to your head, to your hair, by cutting it equally. Not cutting some of it and leaving some of it. <laughs> Sitting in the sun. Don't sit in the sun where half of your body is in the sun and the other half is in the shade. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that that was the maqad of his shaytan. So if you come to Yawm al or to the masjid, and you see that the sun, the light, the beam is coming through, and you want to get in that place, if you see that, the Muslim is always aware and cognizant of what's going on around him, because the religion has shown him the light for every step that he's going to take. Where is he going to sit in this majlis? There's a place that he can sit that's better than the other places. So anyway, if he can help it, don't sit where half of your body is going to be in the sun and the other half is going to be in the shade because you have to give your whole body the haq. And that is, either put it all in the sun or put it all in the shade because that's the maqad of a shaitan, al-adal, al-tam. So I don't know what some of the people who claim the things that they're claiming that they're trying to establish the Khilafah and spread Islam and the Jihad and understand how they are doing the things that they're doing where there's no justice in that is Vulm. The other reason is that the scholars said that it was the issue of the prohibition of a shaitan. Just as a shaitan sits between the sun and the shade, the Prophet وسلم, told us, don't wear one shoe. Because if you wear one shoe, the shaitan, he wears one shoe. So the Muslim, he can't be like the shaitan. Can't be like the shaitan. The ins or the jinn. Whoever resembles a people, then he is from those people. So we don't want to resemble the kuffar and the things that are special for them. They're known by those things. So we come to the next hadith. And it's similar to the one that prohibited, that preceded us, that went by already. Hadith number 82. 
Al Imam Al Tirmidhi brought his chain of narration, all of which is is authentic, collected by Imam Muslim as well, in which Jabir ibn Abdullahi, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, "An al Nabiya sallallahu alaihi wasallam naha an yakula yani al Raju bi shamalihi aw yamshi fi nalim wahida." Jabir said that our Nabi, our Rasul al Mustafa al Mushtaba. As-Sadiq al-Mustuq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He prohibited a man, he prohibited the man from eating with his left hand and from walking in one shoe, walking with one shoe. So that athar is authentic. The prohibition here, there's ikhtilaf between the scholars of al-Islam. Is it the tahrim or is it the kirahiya? Is it dislike or is it not permissible I believe that the Zahiri people they have the haq in this particular issue because we don't have anything that comes that would change this nahi from a tahrim to al kirahiya so if we find the Quran or the Sunnah says don't do this then that thing is haram you can't do it but if there's something else what the scholars of al usul call the sarif it came, the Prophet said, don't do it. But something came and showed us that he did it. Something came and showed us someone else did it in his presence and he allowed it. Then we know it's not haram, but it goes to the level below that and it's something disliked. So in this case, there's nothing like that. No hadith that the Prophet wasallam ever ate with his left hand or his companions ate with their left hand. As a matter of fact, one man, one man, he was lefty. He used to be lutfi, he was lefty. And that man was eating with his left hand, which was natural form. Prophet told that man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, eat with your right hand. He said, I can't. And he did it out of arrogance. He said, bottom. He said I can't. I'm not able to. He said, Belistatat, you can. And when he said that, because the man was arrogant, he became paralyzed in that arm. And then he was forced to eat with his right hand. So the man was naturally lefty. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, فَلْيَحْذِرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبُهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُصِيبُهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Let those people beware who go against and they oppose his command. When he says do this and he says don't do that, let those people who want to go against that beware that you may get a serious fitna or you may get a serious punishment. And the fitna could be you can lose Islam, you can lose, leave the religion, or you'll get a punishment, like what happened to that man, because he did it out of kibr. So here in this hadith, a few issues very quickly. As we mentioned, eating with the left hand is haram, because a shaitan eats with the left hand. And also, walking with one foot is, one shoe on, is haram. But the hadith said, Jabir said that he prohibited a man, the man, one man. He prohibited the man. So now do we understand from that it's permissible for the woman to come and to eat with her left hand? It's okay for the woman to come and to walk with one shoe on? We say, Kalla wallahi. Allah Ta'ala described the Prophet in many ayahs of the Quran. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Qul ya nas, inni rasulullahi ilaykum jami'a. Tell them, may you people I am the messenger of Allah to all of you, to the Arab and the non-Arab, to the black and the white, to the rich and the poor, to the man and the woman. I am the Rasul to everybody. So when I speak to one of you, I'm speaking to all of you. Unless there's a delil that shows I'm not speaking to everyone. So the scholars of Usul again, they say that this kharaja makhraj al-ghalib, this is what was the usual case who was with the Prophet ﷺ on a daily basis? Was it the wife of Abu Bakr Umar Uthman Ali? Was it the wife of those men? No. As a matter of fact, the women wanted to get knowledge. They came and they said, Ya Rasulullah, you're with the men all the time. Make a day for us, the women, to come and learn. He said, okay, go back and talk to the women. You choose someone's house and the day and I'll come. So he went to the house of the ladies. And the very first hadith, he told them, Every woman should know that if she were to lose two children, three children, and they were to die before her in childbirth, 
then she'll go to Jannah. A lady said, what about if she lost two? He said, if she lost two, she'll go to Jannah. That was the first hadith he told those women, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the hadith shows that the women were not with him all the time. The men were with him. So when he speaks to them, he's going to speak and he's going to say things in a way in which the Arabs address the men with the jama' at takdir You know, when you, uh, with, with the jama' at tafkir When you talk to the men, it's different from the way you talk to the women. That's the point. So this hadith is applicable to the women, the women, men and the women equally. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-nisa'u shaqa'iqu rijal Men and the women, they're twins to each other. Everything that's applicable to the men, applicable to the woman, and that's a principle we always have to remember. That is a principle that we always have to remember. Concerning this hadith, there's something we want to bring to your attention, something that is well known about Sheikh al-Islam, Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, rahmatullahi alayhi, from his fatawa. When he taught this hadith, that a man shouldn't walk with one shoe on and one shoe off. When the Q&A session came, someone from the audience wanted to know, Ya Fadilat Sheikh, based on this hadith, if I put one shoe on and the other shoe is one step or two steps away from me, is it permissible for me to walk to my other shoe and only I take him one step or two steps? Is that permissible? Because the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't walk with one shoe. So is it permissible to take one or two steps? One or two steps? The Shaykh, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala, Alayhi said, in istata'ta, أَلَّا تُخَالِفَ السُّنَّ بِخُطْوَةٍ وَاحِدٍ فَفْعَلْ If you have the ability not to oppose the sunnah in one step, then don't oppose the sunnah in one step. You have the ability not to oppose the sunnah in one step, then don't oppose the sunnah in one step. And I say, not being better than the sheikh or trying to top the sheikh, if you have the ability not to oppose the sunnah in half of a step, then don't oppose the sunnah. And don't become philosophical. One step won't hurt me, two steps won't hurt me. La. Those things like that, as Anas ibn Malik said to the tabi'een, he said, in nukum لَتَفْعَلُونَ أَفْعَالًا هِيَ أَدَقُّ عِنْدُكُمْ من الشعر كنا نراها على أهد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من الموبقات. He said to those tabi'un, you people are doing things that you see it as being more or less significant than a strand of hair. If a piece of hair falls off, if someone sees it on the street, he's not going to make a big deal about that. You make you 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 see the things that you're doing as being lesser than a strand of hair. He said, we, during the time of the companions, during the time of Rasulullah, so the Lord, we used to consider those things to be the things that will destroy you. He said that about the tabi'un. What do you think is the case right now? What do you think is the case right now? A person doesn't pray Salat al-Fajr every day. Or a lot, he doesn't pray at all. He doesn't pray the sunan at all. And it's not wajib upon him to pray the sunan. It's not wajib upon him to pray the sunan. But if that individual, like, he doesn't take care of the salat, the salat would prevent him from committing sins. If he does it the right way. But if he doesn't pray, if he doesn't pray, those, pray, those sins will prevent him from making the salat. He doesn't care because he relies on Allah Ghafur Rahim. His wife doesn't wear hijab. He has isbal. So many issues. We see it as being small things. During the time of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they used to see those things as being big. And that's how our life is. That's how the life is right now. And we ask Allah Ta'ala al-afiyah wa salama and al-afu to forgive us because living now is not like living during their time. The next hadith, Ikhwani, is the hadith number 83. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi Wa ala Ali wa sallam in this hadith that al Imam al Tirmidhi brought, and it's been collected by al Imam al Bukhari and Muslim. And as we mentioned a few times, al Imam al Bukhari was the Sheikh of al Imam al Tirmidhi. So with Tirmidhi, sometimes he had the same Sheikh that al Bukhari his Sheikh had a few times. 
and the shiyukh of Al Imam Al Bukhari. Many times they come in Al Imam Al Tirmidhi's books in this chain of narration because he was from his students. Al Imam Al Tirmidhi he brought this chain of narration in which Abu Hurairah may Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Nabi of Al Islam, the Sadiq Al Mustuq, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said. If one of you puts your shoes on, then let him begin with the right. And if you take your shoes off, then let him take it off with his left. And let the right shoe, the right one, be the first one that he starts with. And let the left one be the one that he takes his shoes off with. And that was the general sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My mother Aisha. May Allah be pleased with us. She said, كَانَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ يُعْجِبُهُ وَالْتِيَمَّمْ فِي شُؤُونِهِ كُلِّهَا فِي تَنَعُّلِهِ وَتَرَجُّلِهِ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to light the right in all of his affairs and putting his shoes on and combing his hair and making wudu and tahara, making a ghusl. So this hadith helps us to understand that when it comes to a zina, beautifying yourself, when it comes to issues of virtues, then the right has superiority over the left in al-Islam. Virtues. And the left is the opposite of that. So you're going to eat with your right hand. You're going to drink with your right hand because that's something that's virtuous. Eating, drinking helps you to stay alive. Your hayat is in that, bi'idhnillah. And the opposite holds true. Anything that is dirty, anything that is something that the heart and the soul is repelled by, it, it's repugnant, then you do it with your left hand. You go out into the dunya. The Prophet said, Inna ahab al-biladi Allah masajiduha. The best places to Allah are the masjids. And the worst place, the marketplace. So when you come into the best place, the place of virtue, you come in with your right foot. When you leave, you leave with your left foot. You go into the hamam, akramakum Allah, into the mirhad with your left foot, the place where the jinn are, the place where there's najasa, and you come out of that place with your right foot. So he, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, used to be sure to start off with his right in the things that were virtuous and good, and he would use his left in the things that were repugnant. He sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam taught us everything that we knew or we need to know. Like Sanman al-Faris he said, no bird flew in the sky and flapped his wings except that he told us some wisdom about that bird. So everything that we need to know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, he informed us of those issues. The next hadith, ikhwani, in this particular chapter, is again the hadith of our mother that explains the one previous. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to like at tayammun, at tayammun, and whatever he had the ability to do, and at tayammum, not tayammum with a mean at tayammum, where you make the tayammum from the earth in the place of wudu, you make your Wudu or your tahara with dirt at tayammun with a noon. He used to like it as long as he had the ability in whatever he had the ability to do it in, whether it was putting his shoes on, whether it was combing his hair, whether it was making purification. So if a person is going to make ghusl for an example, he's going to take the soap and wash his right hand first, and then his left hand, and then his private part, and then he's going to write. He's going to do everything according to the right. He goes to the he goes to the barber. He goes to the barber. He doesn't want to go against the sunnah in one foot, taking one step. And he doesn't want to go to the, go, go against the sunnah in one piece of hair. He says to the barber, "Start off with my right side. Say bismillah and start off with the right side." And why should the person be shy to say that? Is his head, is his hair, you own it. You're paying that man to give you a service and a hundred times out of a hundred, hundred percent, 
person is not going to say anything. The Prophet made and he performed Hajj Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and after he performed the Umrah, after he performed his manasik, he went to the barber, he said, say Bismillah and start with the right side. That's your haq. If a person is a barber, he's a barber, then he starts cutting the hair of the people with the right, even if he has customers who are not Muslims. Because the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, he used to like the right. So that's the description that our mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, gave about her husband, our Nabi, our Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The last hadith in this chapter is the hadith again of Abu Huraira. It said that Abu Huraira said that the shoe of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had two laces coming out of the side. Two laces coming out of the side. And so did Abu Bakr. And so did Umar. And the very first person to take a shoe that only had one lace was Uthman. He was Uthman. This hadith, ikhwani, has some issues, some kalam in it. And that, first of all, it does go to show that the shoe that the Prophet wore, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was due to his customs. It had nothing to do with the religion as such. It was due to the custom. The two laces, it has nothing to do with the sunnah. No reward to have a shoe with two laces just because you have two laces. No reward. And the scholars said that is the case because of this ether. Abu Bakr wore a shoe with two laces. Umar wore a shoe with two laces. And then Uthman wore a shoe with one lace. If it was something that was religious and from the sunnah, someone like Uthman would not have ever went against the sunnah. That's the opinion of some of the scholars. And although we feel that that is plausible, but it's not necessarily so. It's not necessarily true. We don't really, we have to be careful about saying things like that because the only person who never ever goes against what is the sunnah is the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Uthman, with all of his virtues, with all of his knowledge, he didn't encompass all of the sunnah. So it's possible he didn't do a particular sunnah because it passed him by. Everybody is like that. There's no human being who he got all of the sunnah except the sahibu sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and everybody else, radwan Allah alayhim, as al-Imam Malik said, when they wanted to use his book, to make his book the destor of the Muslim empire, and he was going to make everybody follow his hadith book, although there were other books of hadith, al-Imam Malik said, no, I'm not going to allow that to happen. Because there's not a person except some of the sunnah passed him by. And that's a refutation against the blind followers of the madahib and the narrow-minded people. And I say narrow-minded, not in a bad way, but it's the reality. You're narrow-minded and you're talking based upon guesswork and ignorance. If you tell someone, you must follow, you must follow a madhab. You must that goes against the kitab and that goes against the sunnah. Allah Ta'ala commanded in the Quran, ma unzila ilaykum. follow what was revealed to you. Ma unzila ilaykum. Wala min dunihi follow what was revealed to you, the Quran and the sunnah, and don't follow the awliya. Don't follow human beings like that. And not only that, the companions said the same thing. The companions told the people the same thing. That you have to follow the Quran. You have to follow the sunnah of the Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa And here Al-Imam Malik is telling the people, no, you don't have to follow my madhab. Just take my book and follow my book. Because there's not a person except the sunnah passed him by. And then when Uthman performed the hajj, he performed the hajj, something like praying in Mina is a well-known sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that when the people are in Mina, we're going to pray all of the four prayers, the three prayers, Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha, we're going to pray them shorted. We won't combine them. We're just going to pray two rakat. Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, Dhuhr, 
He prayed it four rakat. So you can't say if this was from the sunnah, Uthman wouldn't have gone against it. Uthman, why did he go against that? Some people say because he felt he's from the people of Mecca, so he did it. Well, the Prophet was from the people of Mecca, just like Uthman was from the people of Mecca, and the Prophet didn't do it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nor did Abu Bakr, nor did Umar. They didn't do that. Some people said, Uthman may have forgot. Some people said, Uthman didn't know. Whatever the case is, he forgot, didn't know, it passed him by, he thought his people Mecca. We say, the sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, deserves to be followed, and anyone and everyone can make a mistake in that regard, Everyone and anyone. Plus, in addition to that, this particular hadith, Ikhwani, this athar, there's some kalam in it. It doesn't seem to be authentic. In the chain of narration, there is a man by the name of Abdurrahman ibn Qais Abu Muawiyah, the great scholar of al hadith, the one who was an imam in al jarh wa ta'dil, haqqan, al imam Abu Zur'a, al Razi, rahmatullahi alayhi, kathabuhu. He said this man was a kathab. Abdurrahman ibn Qais, Abu Muawiyah used to make kathab in his hadith. And if you're caught lying in the hadith during that time, you and your narration will be rejected. Your narration will be rejected. None of the companions were kathabun as we told you. Ridwan Allahi alayhim so. If you ever find a hadith that says, a tabi said, one of the companions told me, and you don't know who that companion is, it's authentic. As long as the companion really told him that. As long as the companion really told him that. And he himself is truthful. If another companion said that another companion said, then that's also authentic. The jahala of the companion doesn't hurt the hadith. As for the jahala or not knowing someone else in the chain of narration, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. It's going to be a problem. No matter who is narrating on him. No matter who is narrating on him from the people, not from the companions of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. So that ather is not authentic, but it does show that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had two laces, Abu Bakr, and we already took that. So it doesn't have any problem in terms of it's not consequential. Nothing comes as a result of it. There is what is authentic. He, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, has shoes that had two laces and some that had double laces and so forth and so on. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Now we go to the next chapter, Khwani, and that's the chapter of the ring of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his khatam. But before dealing with this chapter, because of a narration that came in the previous chapter about his sandals or his shoes, and another narration that came previous when we did the narrations about his hair, we want to talk very briefly today, inshallah, and a little bit from next week, if we don't get all of it in today, about the athar of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the permissibility of making a tabarruk with it and buy it. A tabarruk, getting the barakah, from his athar, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam taslim in kathira, he, as you saw earlier in the chapter, in the last dars, Anas ibn Malik brought a pair of shoes out. And on those shoes, they had two laces, and they were hairless. And then he showed the people, and he went back in. He brought out to the people the shoes of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So those shoes are from his athar, his relics, the thing that was left behind. So is it permissible to make a tabarruk with that, to take it and to do this with it and to do this with it? If you recall, doing the dars of the hair of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our mother Um Salama, his wife, may Allah be pleased with her. She had some of his hair, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that she put inside of a container. And anyone who got sick from the community, anyone, anyone who got sick, anyone who felt he had the evil eye, they would send her a cup or container. She would put water in it and then pour it in there. 
and keep the hair. And that person would drink from the hair of the water of the hair, the residuals of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So that's what we took. And that goes to show the companions, they used to make a tabarruq with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The things that were connected to his body, they were connected to his body, like his hand and so forth and so on, like his body. And the things that were worn by him, they used to make a tabarruq with it. And by the things that used to come out of his body and off of his body, like the hair, like his spit, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that was also something that the tabi'een did. So is it permissible for us here today? Is that something that we can do? We're going to say, Allahumma na'am, it's permissible. Because if someone were to say this is something that's only specific, peculiar, to the companions only, then they have to bring the dalil. We're going to say, hey, the tabi'een did that with the knowledge of the companions. So if a person said, well, it's only for those two generations, because you don't have it in the third generation and you don't have it afterwards. We're going to say, hey, you have to bring the dalil for that. Where's the dalil? It is mashru. It is mashru. But we're going to have to make some clarifications. There are two types of athar. There are the athar of his sunnah, his sunan, his sunnas. They're called his athar. What he did. Those are from his athar. That's why a person who follows the sunnah, he says that he is salafi, he says that he is athari, an athar. He's following the sunnah, the athar. So there are his adab, there's his akhlaq, there's his mu'amalat, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So concerning them, there's barakah in following that. So there's no doubt about that. Everybody unanimously, we follow that stuff. We follow those things. Those athar. As for his athar of the ones that I mentioned, his clothes and this and that and this, we say then, where is it that these things are present? Where is it that these things are present? Because if you want to take advantage of the Muslims and you want to make money, all you have to do is say that you found the miswak of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the ignorant Muslims with their unlegislated love of the Nabi that doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's sincerity, but it's not with knowledge. They won't ask the question. How can this possibly be the miswak of the Prophet wasallam, and we're living in Anchorage, Alaska? How did his miswak arrive in Anchorage, Alaska? It's possible but for all sense and purposes, that's going to be very, very difficult. But again, religion without knowledge, deen without knowledge, it makes a person do things that intelligent people, they normally wouldn't do those particular things. Knowledge is important. So let us mention a few things. It is permissible. And there should be no doubt about this. And the people of the sunnah should not be people who are rough and tough as it relates to this, because we see we have a knee-jerk reaction to what some of our brothers do, like the foot that was supposed to be the footprint of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Pakistan, and people came from long distances making a journey to see that footprint. And the footprint was bigger than this table. It was bigger than this table. Person with knowledge has to say, okay, we're reading the Shema'il of, of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We know that a long time ago, human beings were very large. They were giants. But the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know what his foot was like because we took the descriptions about him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He has to have some knowledge. So those companions used to, no doubt, they used to make a tabarruk with as much as they could from the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And therefore, as people were following them, we have to be open to that idea that it's possible. And if we have the opportunity, it is virtuous to do it. It's part of our love and our iman. So the point here is, don't be a person whose heart is hard and you're cold 
towards these issues because people did him the wrong way. Good akhlaq and good adab, being on the sunnah, being on the sunnah is to have good akhlaq and good adab. There's nothing wrong with having good akhlaq, good adab. You don't have to be rough, you don't have to be tough in the wrong places. So anyway, let's take a look at a number of these examples and then we'll come back to the issue. What do we do today? Because if you were to look inside Al-Bukhari, many of the chapters of Imam Al-Bukhari has the chapter of the sword of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the chapter of his spear, the chapter of his saddle, the chapter of his utensils, the chapter of this and the chapter of that. Because some of the people were still protecting some of these instruments that were used by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that there's no doubt, inshallah, we share this with you very quickly, very quickly, bi-idhnillahi tabarak wa ta'ala. And what was collected by Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim, our mother Aisha said that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to always read, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ In order to do ruqya on himself. But when he became very, very, very sick before his death, she said he wasn't able to read it. So because she saw him doing this all the time, she said, I read on him and for him. And I used to take his hand. Because he was so weak, I would take his hand and I would put it on him and I would put it on me in order to get the barakah from the ruqya of his hand, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. The companions used to sit and they used to eat with the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wherever his hands went, if they came after he ate or if they were sitting with him, they would try to put their hands where his fingers were in order to get the barakah from the hand of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. And what was collected by Imam al-Bukhari, the companion, Abu Juhayfa, radiallahu anhu, he said that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, he made the salat with the people. And then after performing the salat, the people went to him and they started touching his hand, started making barakah from his hands. And wiping themselves, wiping their faces with his hands. He said, and I was one of the last ones to do it. And when I went to touch his hand to get the barakah, his hands were very, very cold. Although it was hot and it was the dhuha prayer. Because he left at the time of al-hajra. The time of the sun being very hot. So that's a clear indication example of the companions trying to get the barakah from his hands. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. As for those things that were off of his body, and there are other things that we can mention, like that companion of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam who was a bit of a comedian. He had a sense of humor. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam poked him in the side, and he said, "Oh, yeah, Rasulullah, you hurt me." And the religion of Islam is justice, and I have to get my hawk back from you. The Prophet said, "Okay, poke me back." The man said, but you poked me and I didn't have any covering. I didn't have anything covering me. So the Prophet ﷺ lifted up his shirt and the man grabbed him and kissed him right back here. And he said, that's all I wanted was to get the barakah. And the Prophet allowed that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he used to allow his companions. And that goes to show his sense of humor. That goes to show his sabr, his attahamul. His attahamul, attahamul in this case is someone comes to you like, your child is sitting on you. Your wife wants to sit on you. And you, just, you say, to, come on now. Come on now. The Prophet wasallam used to accommodate people when they came close to him like that. And you'll never find, you'll never find that he pushed people away when they wanted to be close up on him like that, sharing his space. wasallam. From those examples is... Like I told you when he performed Hajj, he told the man, start on the right, say Bismillah. After the man cut his hair, he gave his hair to the companions. He gave his hair. Another time he got a haircut, said Bukhari, his hair will fall and they will go and they will try to catch the hair before it fell and they maintain the hair. Where else did Um Salama get the hair? Where else did Um Salama get the hair? The people would bring her the vessels and she would pour water in it and give it to them to drink, getting the barakah, inshallah, from the 
hair of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tremendous example as well, Ikhwani, is what happened with Urwa, Ibn Mas'ud al thaqafi radiallahu anhu, who on the day of the sulh of al hudaybiyah when the Prophet sallallahu religion was growing and spreading and they went to perform the manasik at the house of Allah from Medina to Mecca, and the kuffar came out and said, no, you're not going to perform it. We're going to prevent you from performing it. And the Prophet went into a negotiating, negotiation with them. The kuffar of Quraysh on that day, Urwa ibn Mas'ud, was a non-Muslim. He came and he started negotiating. Now we're not going to get into the details of that, but that historical event is important. It is extremely important. And one of the tremendous things that happened in that day, one of the tremendous things is that as Zubair or Urwa ibn Mas'ud, when he went back to the Kufa of Quraysh to tell them what had happened, that I agree with Muhammad, don't write Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim I agree with Muhammad, don't write between Quraysh and Muhammad, Rasulullah. I agree with Muhammad that they can't make Hajj this year. I agree with Muhammad, if someone comes to us from their side, we keep them. Someone comes to them from our, the our side, they have to send them back. So many issues all appeared on the side of Quraysh. One of the big things that happened that day is when this man went back to the Kufa of Quraysh, he said, listen, I've been in the majlis, in the assembly of the leader of Persia and the leader of Rome. He said, I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, I never, ever, ever saw a leader who was respected and honored and protected like Muhammad's companions protect him, honor him, respect him. He said, if he made wudu, they were fighting each other to get that water. If he told them to do something, they would do it immediately without hesitating. If he commanded something, they would not look at him while he was talking. And if he tanakhama nukhamatan. And nukhama is when you do that spit from your nose with the mucus. If Muhammad did that, they would go and they would get it and they would put it on their faces. Now, the companions, they were men and they had izza. They were not people who, as I told you before, in a claim we love the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we say things like, I wish I could be the shoe of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Forget this shoe, forget this shoe. I wish I could be his sword. Okay, you use his sword, but you don't go to Jannah. You want to be a human being. Or you want to be with him like one of those human beings. When Waraka ibn Nawfil, the cousin of Aisha, the cousin of Khadija, may Allah be pleased with both of them. When Jibril came to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Khadija said, go to my cousin Waraka, he has news about this. And the Prophet told him the story about Jibril coming to him and squeezing him, telling him to read. Waraka ibn Nawfil said, I wish I was young when your people put you out and expel you from, from, from Mecca. I wish I was young because you would see for me an amazing thing, the way I'm going to deal with it. He was over 80 years old. Rasulullah said, are the people going to put me out? Quraysh are going to put me out? If you know the ilm al-ghayb, if he knew, he wouldn't ask that question. He's new. The da'wah was just beginning. He hadn't been commanded to do anything yet. No da'wah. Just iqra. He said, are my people going to put me out? Waraka said, yes, yes, yes. No one ever came with what you came with except that he was bothered. Udia, udia. People took him as an adu. They became an enemy to him. So the point here is, Waraka ibn Nofel, he said, I wish I was young. I wish I was young. He knows that he can't be young. That's the tamanni that's permissible. The tamanni, the hope and the wish that's permissible. You can wish that you were there with him. You can wish that you married his daughter. You can wish. I wish. As for I wish I was his shoes. I wish I was his donkey. I wish that I was a saddle. I wish. La, that's, companions weren't like that. Al Imam Al Hafid ibn Hajar, he said, It may be the reason why the companions took that type of spittle, the nukhama, 
and put it in their faces was to show Urwa, Ibn Mas'ud, hey, don't think for one minute that we're going to leave this man to come back to you people and to be with Quraysh. Don't think for one minute that we're going to leave him for you people to get him. We're with him. And we're going to prove that to you by the way they were dealing with him. In front of him, showing and getting the water. In front of him, to the point where he made that nukhama and they picked it up and put it in their faces. Wallahi, if the Prophet was here with one of us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with all of us and he were to do that I don't think anybody is going to have a problem with doing that I don't, have, I don't think anybody from the youngster to the eldest from amongst us but you let some other sheikh come here a real good sheikh too a sheikh of the sunnah you let him come and let him spit I'm not gonna, we're not going to who's going to do that some of us will some of us will I don't know about this particular majlis, but you all know what happened when the Sheikh of Sudais came. They stole his shoes. They stole his shoes. And the Sheikh was delayed. And some people were running after his car and making barakah with his car. And some people said that he was the king of the hearts and he holds the hearts. Hey, come on. Come on. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes with anybody. And we don't let ourselves go down like that. So as it relates to the companions, Ridwan Allah alayhim, the Prophet ﷺ allowed them to do this. So again, the point here that we're trying to make to you brothers is, this is something that is permissible, and a lot of that has happened. A lot of that has happened. Um Sulaim, and what was collected by the Imam Muslim, the Prophet used to go to her house, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to sleep in her bed, and he would take a nap in her bed. When she wasn't in her bed, obviously. And that's what the narrator said. So that people who have craziness and evil in their heart, they want to take these types of uh, thought and examples to show that the Prophet was a womanizer, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are some a hadith that could suggest that for the one who is ignorant or the one who is diseased or the one who doesn't have iman. You can read some a hadith that are authentic that could suggest that. Realities. He married 11 women. And it's haram for everybody else. The way he married Zainab. People take those examples as opportunities to have a dig at him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But people with al-iman, they said no. They are plausible explanations. He used to come to Umm Sulaim's house because her son was very close to him. Umm Sulaim was from the awliya of Allah. The prophet was close to her husband and so forth and so on. One day she went home. When he was there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and while he was sleeping, she took the sweat off of his face and put it into the thing and saved it. When the Prophet woke up, he said, what are you doing? She said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to get the barakah from your sweat for our children. I want to get the barakah from your sweat for our children. Use it on our children as perfume. He told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asabti. Asabti, you did good job. Akarraha on what she did. He said, this is my tacit approval. This is something permissible. So we have those examples. Lastly, last, lastly, Akhwani, concerning these examples, and as I mentioned, they are a lot. With his clothes, with his clothes. The hadith that we took about the shoes, Anas ibn Malik didn't make a tabarruq. He just brought it out. But what we were trying to show to you was that the Prophet's clothes, his shoes, his utensils, they remained after his death. And the companions kept some of his things, kept his hair, kept this, kept that. But as it relates to the issue of his clothes, Sahl ibn Sa'id said that a woman came, may Allah be pleased with him and her. And the lady gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a burda to wear and he needed it. And then he took the burda to wear it right away. He put it on because he needed it. And he wasn't too proud. It was a gift. He took it, he put it on. Another man in the majlis said, Ya Rasulullah, this is beautiful. That thing is beautiful. Can I have it? He just didn't say it's beautiful. He said, can I have it? Can you give it to me? The Prophet Wasallam immediately took it off and gave it to the man. And then he got up and he left. The people were upset. They said, what are you doing? You knew he needed it. And you know that he doesn't say no to someone who asked him. What are you doing? 
The man said, well, I don't need it. I don't need it. I only took it because when he put it on to wear it, I want to wear it for the buttercup, and I hope when I die, I'm going to get buried in it. It's mine now. And then the people were feeling like, oh, I wish I was the one who thought about that. I wish I was the one who thought about that. And Ikhwani, as you brothers smiled, you chuckled a little bit. Our Nabi and his companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were like us in that. There were those things to smile about, and there were those things that happened between them that happened between them. But when those misunderstandings took place between them, those misunderstandings were not in their hearts. Those misunderstandings let it go. They let that stuff go. When his daughter died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to the women who were burying her, he took his izar, he had an izar, not took it off, he had an izar. He took the izar, the lower portion that you wear, he said, bury her in this, and they wrapped it around her, along with her kefid. Why? For the barakah of his clothes. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So, ikhwani, concerning all of these issues, it's a clear indication, it's clear proof that the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, his companions used to make a tabarruk and the tabi'een after them, they used to make a tabarruk with the things that the Prophet used to have, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that ruling is still standing until yawm al-qiyamah. Now the question is, are these things still around? Are these things still around? And we're going to leave that question, inshallah, to be the first thing that we deal with in the next dars, because it's important. If this hukum is still remaining, then can we do the tabarruk of those things? Yes. Are they still around? Inshallah, we'll do with the rest of that in the next class on Wednesday. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على النبينا وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته